Hi, my name is Shari Wiseman. I'm the chief editor of Nature Neuroscience, and I'm here with Paulina Anakeva, who is a professor at MIT. And Paulina, can you tell us a little bit about your background? I think your background is probably a little bit different than some of the other people who are at this meeting. Of course. Uh, so uh, my background started out in physics as an undergraduate with a concentration in biophysics. So I did take my classes in cellular molecular biology, immunology, and neuroscience, but largely studied physics. Um, and then I did my PhD in material science and engineering at MIT but uh, my advisor was electrical engineer and I worked in optoelectronics uh, and particularly uh, quantum dot light emitting devices, which you can now find in um, uh, commercial uh, light emitting displays. And uh, then I got pretty bored and I wanted to work on something that was not simply an improving an existing technology, but something that would open a frontier. And uh, biology provide that, provided that frontier. And I turned to neuroscience and did my postdoc with Professor Carl Dyseros at Stanford, working in early days of optogenetics and starting to develop devices to interface with the nervous system. And so I take it most of the work that you did in Carl Dyseros' lab and, and maybe at the beginning of your own lab was focused on the brain. What made you decide to move, <laughs> what made you decide that that's too simple and you want to move beyond the brain? So uh, indeed, uh, I started my career in neuroscience and neurotechnology, developing tools to study the central nervous system, the brain, a little bit in the spinal cord, but largely in the wonderful system of the brain surrounded by skull, very convenient, you can mm. attach all kinds of hardware to it. Um, but then one day I was at a meeting for uh, dedicated to deep brain stimulation in the context of motor disorders and it was in Europe and uh, people talked a lot about uh, Parkinson's disease and um, at some point a colleague brought up the idea of staging hypothesis uh, posed by Brock in 2003 that Parkinson's has a significant GI component and that was the first time when I heard about the periphery, mm. and I, uh, to the great uh, amaze, amusement and I guess uh, testament to my um, lack of um, appropriate biological education, I found out that there was a nervous system in the GI tract, the enteric nervous system, and I also started learning about the innervation of that organ, and I fell in love with its incredible complexity, and I thought, wow, this is such a difficult system to study and it is absolutely worth my time. Mm. So, and, um, and that was around 2017 and that's when I decided that our lab will no longer exclusively work on the central nervous system, but we will start working on the periphery. Yeah. So you mentioned that it's a difficult system to study. Can you maybe elaborate on that? What makes it so hard to study the mm. gut or to study internal organs? So let's, let's start with the gut because this is where most of our uh, work has been uh, in the context of the periphery. So the GI tract is extremely long. Uh, in a, I think it's about 800% of a mouse's length. And for a person, I think it's about four to 500% of a person's length, mm -hmm. the length of the GI tract. It is uh, main functions are of course, uh, sensing and digestion and um, expulsion of uh, waste products. And uh, as a result, there's many stages, so there's a lot of anatomical diversity to the gut. But then when we're thinking about it from an engineering standpoint, we have to take into account that this is the system that moves, that continuously extends, stretches, deforms, and churns the contents. It is also full of content, and that content is not a, a nice, let's say, cerebrospinal fluid, but a really quite a harsh environment with uh, bile and fecal matter and food and um, a variety of, uh, um, and there is of course the microbiome and so this is very challenging contents that electronics are not good at dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, electronics are good in nice pristine environments but not in something that is full of stuff. Uh, 
uh, such as bile. And then when we're thinking about the, where the nervous system in the gut actually is, it's all within a thin gut wall. And it, we can think of the enteric nervous system as being confined, confined to two plexi, the myenteric, which is kind of the outer plexus, largely responsible for the muscle movement in the GI, and the submucosal plexus, which is closer to the luminal space, and that's where um, a lot of sensory uh, processing uh, takes place. But there's also rich innervation coming from the central nervous system. And all of that is lives within this really, really thin wall. In the mouse, it's only about 300 micron thick. And now when we're thinking about you know, puncturing that wall or producing any kind of damage, which is really easy to do, we can cause really substantial immune response. We can cause some serious inflammatory reaction, which can be detrimental to animal health, potentially deadly to animal health, uh, deadly. Um, so how do we reconcile a system that is mechanically challenging, chemically harsh, and at the same time incredibly delicate? Mm. So we need a device that can withstand its environment but not hurt it at the same time. So that's, um, and that's where uh, I find this a really remarkable engineering frontier. Mm. So can you talk a little bit about what kinds of experiments um, the devices that your lab builds are designed to do? What kinds of questions you can ask? So we, um, to give you a little bit of a perspective, first we'll talk about the devices themselves mm -hmm. a little bit, and then we'll talk about the studies where we have already applied them in, and then what future may hold. Mm -hmm. So to give every, uh, people a feel for our technologies is, imagine a device that is as thin as your hair, and inside it live different sensors and electronics. We can, for example, introduce tiny little LEDs, temperature sensors, uh, other types of sensors, pressure sensors, and so forth. We can also introduce drug delivery, microfluidic channels. All of that is confined to a hair-thin structure that can also stretch and bend with um, the movement of the GI tract. Now we can envision that we can now introduce those devices directly into the gut lumen, something that was not uh, previously possible with tools that are uh, maybe more rigid mm. or more uh, or sharper or could be potentially damaging to the delicate system. So now that we can go inside the GI, we have this window to be able to manipulate types of cells that reside within the GI or the external innervation of, uh, inside the GI tract. And uh, f uh, we started this journey f through a wonderful collaboration with Professor Diego Bajorquez at mm. Duke, who was uh, interested in nutrient sensing in the GI tract. His group, among other uh, groups, has been uh, looking at a group of cells, enteroendocrine cells, that are capable of forming uh, synapses with vagal afferents and transmit their chemically sensed signals to the central nervous system through those synapses. But it was very difficult to do those experiments. In fact, it was not possible to test the sensory function in behaving animals without being able to directly manipulate their activity during the said behavior. And this was our first entry into this world where we have essentially enabled optogen optogenetics, which is the a way to control neural activity or activity of other electrogenic cells with light, but we did it in the context of GI tract. So mm. uh, this was the first demonstration of optogenetics in the gut. And uh, we were able to show that uh, these enteroendocrine cells that are expressing cholecystokinin were necessary for sensing sugars in the gut. And in fact, uh, that was the work that we first published together with Diego in Nature Neuroscience. In Nature Neuroscience. So that was, uh, um, and since then we uh, have ex expanded on this work and developed tools to be able to manipulate many different cell types in the GI tract. Uh, and we were able to, for example, demonstrate that uh, a particular group of neurons uh, in ileum, um, so a little bit lower into upper GI, PYY neurons that are producing peptide YY, but also the famous GLP-1 that mm. we, everyone is currently very excited about. Those hormones have been linked to a sense uh, ileal break, which is the sensation of fullness 
uh, after eating rich foods, but it has never been possible to directly link the activity of those cells to this phenomenon. But using our technology, we were able to modulate the activity of these cells precisely in the ileum while animals were uh, consuming food. And indeed, animals would, even when they were hungry, would not eat their favorite rich milkshakes, essentially, <laughs> yes. when we stimulate those cells. So in fact, um, that is, there is a direct connection. But then we can take it, start taking this research a step further and start asking ourselves, well, if we, can, if we can start stimulating neural activity that is um, linked to our perception of reward when we consume delicious uh, sugary foods, but is there a way for us maybe bypass those circuits visa, uh, that typically linked to, to sugars, but maybe we can um, link it directly to neural activity. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do this again with our technology, first demonstrating that indeed infusion of sugars with our devices directly into upper GI tract immediately triggers dopamine neuron transition from uh, tonic, which is kind of slow baseline mm -hmm. firing, to rapid phasic firing associated with dopamine release. So basically sugar in your gut immediately makes you happy yeah. uh, in the in the very simplistic, uh, overly simplistic terms. And then following up on that and learning from the uh, wonderful work that uh, preceded us uh, from um, doctors Evan Araujo and others, we could then stimulate vagus uh, nerve afferents in the upper GI tract, leaving everything else alone and get the sensation of reward in a very classic behavioral essay called the place preference, where animals typically would receive stimulation on one side of the arena, but not on the other side of the arena. That behavior has been linked to dopamine neuron function across oh so many essays. Mm -hmm. But now we left the brain alone and we're able to stimulate this uh, effect purely from the gut. Mm. Setting the stage for studying inputs from the gut to those central nervous system circuits, not maybe necessarily in the context of just food, but maybe starting to think how those inputs from the GI tract influence higher level neural function, such as decision making for example, mm. or affect all of those circuits, all of those processes have a big component of that being rewarding. Mm. Oh, very interesting. So we only have um, a little over a minute left. I was wondering if maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, what are sort of the future directions for your lab or what are the big open questions that you'd really like to be able to answer? So we can break them those questions into technology and biology. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a technology standpoint, I believe that we just scratched the surface um, being able to interface with um, the GI lumen. Of course, every organ in the body is innervated. Mm. We have been thinking of those organs as purely receiving information from the central nervous system, but now we learn more and more that that information also gets processed in the organs and sent back to the central nervous system and studying how those peripheral organs contribute to central nervous system function is fascinating to me and we are very interested in designing interfaces for a variety of organs, maybe extending it even to organ to organ uh, mm. communication. So multiple organs maybe in the same animal. M multiple organs in the same animal, uh, multiple brain regions, multiple organs. So uh, all of that should be enabled by our technology in the coming years. And then, of course, that technology brings together, uh, brings with it the opportunities for new biology. Uh, for us, in our group, interest how um, organs communicate to the brain in the context of higher level behaviors, particularly affect. But uh, we are uh, clearly uh, going to collaborate with many wonderful colleagues, including the colleagues that we met here uh, mm. at, at the symposium and um, to work on um, other uh, potential contributions uh, of organ systems to um, uh, to the brain versus brain communication back to the organ systems. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. This has been really interesting. Thank you very much.